Each year in the United States, thousands of major crimes go unsolved. When the case has gone cold and police have nowhere to turn, they seek assistance from the public. This is a program dedicated to solving these cases. This is Crime Stoppers Case Files. Good evening, and welcome to another Northeast Ohio edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files. I'm Bob France. There are over 1,400 Crime Stoppers organizations operating around the world. These organizations empower citizens like you and me to become directly and anonymously involved in fighting crime in our communities. We see the positive impact of this every day right here in Northeast Ohio. Crime Stoppers is an important law enforcement tool, a proactive approach to removing dangerous criminals from the streets and making them safer for everyone. Each week on this television program, we'll share facts with you from unsolved cases and you'll have an opportunity to submit information that may help investigators possibly earning yourself a cash reward in the process without ever having to give your name. Our first case this evening occurred on April 26, 2007, when 29-year-old Jermaine Mitchell was shot and killed near his apartment in Euclid. Jermaine was my third child, and he was a very quiet, always had a quiet demeanor, caring, soft-spoken. Loving person, and just real fun to be around, a genuine person. But we were always together, we were real close. I love him very much. When you saw one, you saw two. Even as they grew up and became older, they pretty much had the same friends and traveled in the same circles. I had the pleasure of meeting Jermaine for the first time, I would say, in 1995. We were all teenagers. Uh, we just hung out every day, did normal stuff. We loved to watch the basketball games together. He, did, he was a sportsman, loved sports of all types, and, and he loved cooking. He was a very good cook. Learned from his mom in the kitchen. The only time I had the pleasure of tasting his food was on like holidays when uh, he was at the barbecue. Uh, his wings were good, I had to admit. <laughs> He loved his family. He loved the Lord. When Jermaine was murdered, he was 27 years old. His son was six months, and Jermaine was trying to emulate his dad. He um, was in the delivery room. He cut the cord. He wanted to do the same thing that his dad did. And that was one of the highlights of his life, as if seeing that baby come out, and they had a son, Kyle Mitchell. This is uh, Kyle Jermaine Mitchell. This is his son. And at six months, um, he lost his dad. He was murdered. And he didn't want to name his son a junior. But after he was born, and he saw how much he looked so much like him, he said, oh, I should have named him a junior. But at least he has his name, only it reversed. His name is Kyle Jermaine Mitchell. So he still carries his dad's uh, name. And we're just doing our best to keep Jermaine alive just for the simple fact from telling all the positive stories and who he was and all the things he accomplished and would have accomplished if he was still here. 911, what is your emergency? I just heard gunshots. On Knuth, yeah, we're already on our way. Do you know anything more? Yeah, the boy on the ground. Where is the boy on the ground at? 1553 Knuth Ave. Okay, in front or back? In the front. Okay, we're going to get the ambulance and the police over there right now. Okay. It was a Thursday night, uh, April 26th, uh, 2007. Jermaine Mitchell uh, was uh, watching TV inside his apartment with his uh, longtime childhood friend. They were watching the basketball game and decided to go out and get something to eat. They uh, exited Jermaine's apartment and they walked up Knuth Avenue with the intention of going to KFC, located at the intersection of East 260th and Euclid Avenue and Knuth. Uh, when they uh, walked up to the restaurant, they realized it was closed, decided to go across the street, get to another restaurant, decided against it, walked into a Shell station. We also have surveillance video from the Shell gas station that shows Jermaine walking from KFC across the street, Euclid Avenue, and then coming back into the gas station where Jermaine buys a black and mild. Both Jermaine and his friend then exit the gas station and leave the view of the camera. At that point, they're walking down Knuth, back towards the apartment where the shooting occurred. At this point, Jermaine's friend saw a female walking on the other side of the street, decided to cross the street and start a conversation with her. 
At that very moment, they heard gunshots, uh, turned around and saw Jermaine fall to the ground. The friend and the female took off running from the area at this point. When he came back, police were arriving already. Jermaine was uh, on the ground. He was later pronounced dead at uh, Huron Road Hospital where he was transported to. That evening, I call it the night from hell, one of the worst nights, and I was walking around in a trance because it's like, okay, okay, this is just, this was, I was in a bad dream, and I'm gonna wake up, and everything is gonna be the way it was, but unfortunately, that's not the way it was. It was the truth. I've lived in Euclid almost my whole life, since 1985. Uh, that type of thing don't happen out there. And it took a long time to really understand and accept what happened, if you still want to say I accepted it, in a sense I did, in a sense I still don't, because I don't understand it. We'll be back with more on the murder of Jermaine Mitchell when we return. In 1975, the first Crime Stoppers organization was formed by a detective who believed media attention helped solve cases. Since then, thousands of Crime Stoppers organizations have been formed around the globe with the same mission, encouraging members of the public to stand up against crime. Every 14 minutes, Crime Stoppers help solve a crime somewhere in the world. Get involved. Contact your Crime Stoppers organization and learn how you can help. Leave a tip, crimestoppers1.com. On Thursday, April 26, 2007, shortly before 11 p.m., Jermaine Mitchell and his friend were walking to a restaurant to get something to eat. On the way back, Jermaine was murdered, shot at three times, one shot fatally killing him, shot in the back at close range. It appears that the first shot that was fired is more than likely the shot that killed Jermaine. He was shot from uh, about four feet away in the back and the bullet severed his spine, immediately dropping him to the ground. The second shot that was fired actually missed his back and went through his clothing. That bullet was not recovered. The third shot, uh, evidence suggests, was meant for the victim's head. The shooter actually missed and bullet fragments were uh, recovered in the ground. So one out of three shots fired, but that was the fatal shot. Witnesses involved report seeing uh, the shooter as being a uh, black male in his late 20s, uh, approximately six feet tall, medium build, uh, wearing all black clothing. Jermaine was all around a good citizen, no criminal record, not even a traffic ticket. That's where the mystery lies. Why? Why would somebody do this to him? My world has never been the same since that, and I'll never be the person I was, you know, proud of his death. And uh, I believe it's the worst thing could ever happen to any parent. I'm not the same, don't know if I'll ever be the same. Nothing you want to deal with. I have no worries. I know that he's fine. I know that he's with the Lord. I know that I will see my brother again. Sometimes I want to pick up the phone and call him. And I forget he ain't there. And we're hoping that through the years that whoever the person or persons were that have committed this act, that they've been talking and they feel relieved now that they've, okay, you know, I've gotten away with it. And maybe they're relaxed more in speaking and talking about it. And if you've overheard someone saying anything, just come forward so we can start living a little more. If anybody has any information about this terrible crime, please uh, give Crime Stoppers a call. Give me a call personally. My name is Detective Anthony Medved. The Detective Bureau's phone number is 216-289-8505. We want to get this guy off the streets. We want to make sure he doesn't do anything like this ever again. It is such a tragedy when a young life is cut short. For nearly five years, Euclid police and Jermaine's family have been seeking answers to this murder. Someone out there knows something. Maybe it's you. Maybe you've been too afraid to come forward. But if you can help authorities solve this case, Please call Crime Stoppers at 216-252-7463 and you will remain anonymous and you may be eligible for a cash reward of up to $2,000. And coming up, a troubling murder and arson in Fairview Park when we return to Crime Stoppers Case Files. On August 29th, 2007, the Fairview Park Fire Department responded to a house fire on West 220th. Inside, 
they found the body of 67-year-old Gwen Bewley lying among the charred ruins of her own kitchen. Here's the story. My mom was only 67. She was very adventurous. She liked to golf. She was on a golfing league. She liked to skate every day. She was taking skating lessons, roller skating lessons. She was just very active. She loved to go dancing. She was very close with her only sister, Carol, our Aunt Carol. We just always had all the holidays together. My mom was just always trying to keep the family together. Had a lot of uh, parties in the backyard. Gwen was 67 years old, uh, sort of a free spirit. She had the three daughters. Uh, she was a, a mother, a grandmother, and a friend to a lot of people. And uh, I know that she retired for, uh, as a clerk from a drugstore. She was working three jobs at one time just to make ends meet. Very independent. Got divorced from my dad when I was about 18. Neither of my parents ever remarried, but she dated, and uh, nothing ever worked out to get remarried. But she just lived life to the fullest, and she just enjoyed herself. And um, she would have lived to be 100. She had more energy than two 40-year-olds put together. She went parasailing, which I'd never do. <laughs> she um, was just beginning to enjoy retirement when her sister passed away on September 11, 2006. We were still trying to get to our aunt's death. And um, I heard about my mom. She should still be here. Uh, 911, what's your emergency? Uh, house fire. Where at? Uh, 4319 West 220th Street. We're right across from the new school. Okay, I'm going to transfer you to fire. Stay on the line, okay? Okay. On Wednesday, August 29, 2007, at 4.45 p.m., some construction workers working across the street from 4319 West 220 Street noticed smoke coming in from the roof area of the house. They called 911. Uh, I was on patrol in my police car. I got there in about 45 seconds. When I pulled up, I saw the smoke coming out of the top of the house. As I was approaching the house, a neighbor came next door and I said, is there anybody inside? He looked at the driveway, saw that the resident's car was in the drive said, my guide Gwen, I think she's in the house. Firefighters from uh, Fairview Park and six other communities showed up uh, and put the fire out. When the fire was uh, extinguished, they discovered a body of a female in the kitchen of the house, who was later identified as the homeowner, Gwendolyn Bewley. They determined that her death was a homicide by violent means. She left roller skating classes at about 1.40 in the afternoon. We know she made it home because she had a phone conversation with a friend about 2.05. Um, what happened between 2.05 and the time that the fire was discovered, which was 4.45, we're not sure. We do believe that whoever is responsible was let in, that she was familiar with this person, that she let that person in the house. We found no evidence of a forced entry where the doors were broken in. So it's a good possibility that she was familiar with the person who, who killed her. The fire marshal's investigation showed that the fire was arson, and we believe it was said to conceal uh, the crime or evidence of the crime. We'll be right back with more on the murder of Gwen Bewley when we return to Crime Stoppers Case Files. Welcome back to Crime Stoppers Case Files. We now return you to the story of the murder of 67-year-old Gwen Bewley. On uh, August 29, 2007, at 4.45 p.m., uh, Fairview Park Police and Fire went to a house fire at 4319 West 220 Street in Fairview Park, where we discovered the body of Gwen Bewley. The fire marshal's investigation showed that the fire was arson. They determined that her death was a homicide by violent means and we believe it was set to conceal the crime or evidence of the crime. The fire was set approximately when a new school right across the street, Gillis Suite, was letting out. So we would think that there were some people in there that might have seen something or know something. Uh, Gwen was last seen alive about 1.40 that afternoon at uh, a roller rink in Brook Park, Ohio. 
She uh, had a phone conversation with a friend about, I think it was two o'clock from her house. So if anybody would have any information, we would like some help in uh, solving this case. I didn't want to believe it. I just, I, in shock, I tried to think that, you know, was there a coffee pot or faulty wiring or something? Then later on, I learned that there was no smoke in her lungs. It was considered a homicide, an arson, and we're left wondering who did this to her. There's been no suspects named. We just would like anyone to come forward with information that would help this case and uh, help our family have some closure and um, justice for my mother. In Fairview Park, we have a murder about once every 10 years, if that. Uh, we're really looking to solve this. It's not something that happens every day in our city, and uh, we're doing everything we can to solve this. Just any kind of information would be helpful. I just don't want to see this happen to anyone else. And I pray to God that there's some justice out there for my mother, and that whoever did this is punished to the fullest extent of the law. Because Gwen was loved by many and, and we really want to solve this case, so we're really looking for your help. Uh, in addition to the Crime Stoppers reward, mm -hmm. there's also a reward available through the Ohio State Fire Marshals to help solve the arson. You take your mother for granted and you just don't ever think that anything like this would ever happen to one of your relatives, especially your mother. It's not like you know, my mother was sick and I was able to cope with her sickness. I mean, she was just taken. And I, you don't get to say goodbye. You just, you're just, she just taken. In September 2007, a 58-year-old Fairview Park resident was arrested for using Gwen's credit cards after her death. In January 2009, he was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for the theft. But so far, no one has been charged with her murder. Everyone loved Gwen, from her roller skating pals to her children and her grandkids. She is sorely missed. And if you have any information that could help Fairview Park Police or county prosecutors find justice for Gwen Bewley's family, call Crime Stoppers at 216-252-7463. You can remain anonymous and you will be eligible for a cash reward of up to $2,000. On July 2, 2010, 20 year old Joshua Browning allegedly shot 23 year old Brian McGrady in an act of retaliation and mistaken identity. Uh, early Friday morning on uh, July 2, 2010, the victim, Brian McGrady, was at the home of one of his friends at 3185 West 44th Street. They were sitting on the porch uh, just enjoying the evening. About 2 o'clock in the morning, the suspect approached on foot, made some small talk with uh, Brian and his friends. He asked him what time it was. He asked him if they had a light. Then he, he called the victim by the name of Herb. He introduced himself as Josh. He said, uh, I'm Josh, and this is for TJ. At that point, he, he pulled out a nine millimeter pistol and fired several shots at the victim. Uh, we believe that the victim was shot uh, four times. However, those four shots inflicted nine different wounds on the victim's body. But the victim held up his hand to defend himself and. Some of the bullets went through his arms and his hands and into his body. The suspect then left on foot. Uh, the victim died a short time later at Metro Hospital. It became clear right off the bat that Browning had shot the wrong person. He had intended to shoot a person who had previously that month shot his cousin on the same street. Uh, he mistook the victim, uh, Brian McGrady, for that person. So Brian's truly a, a totally innocent person in this crime. We consider Josh Browning armed and dangerous. He's a white male, he's approximately six feet tall, somewhere between 200 and 220 pounds. Uh, he does have several distinguishing features. First, he has freckles on his face, and then he either has or had a cast on his left hand. Uh, we do not know at this time if he still has the cast. Another distinguishing feature he has is a tattoo of praying hands on his right rear shoulder. You can call our 1-866-4-WANTED number. There is a cash reward available and you can remain anonymous. Thank you for joining us for Crime Stoppers Case Files, where you are empowered to help clean up our streets. Remember, our towns, our neighborhoods, they're a direct reflection of what we allow them to be. So let's all do our part to make them safe.
and we'll see you next week for another edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files.